Hi, and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about research ethics. When we think about the scientific research process, it's important that we think, as social scientists, that our primary observations will be a person's. Thus, we need to think about how to ethically deal with taking and collecting data from persons. So to begin with, let's think about the history of research ethics in the United States. Prior to 1906, when the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, there were no regulations regarding the ethical use of human subjects in research. There were no consumer regulations, no Food and Drug Administration, no Common Rule, and no institutional review boards at universities. What follows is a brief discussion of why federal rules and regulations were established and why the IRB became necessary at universities. In 1945, at the conclusion of the Second World War, Nazi war criminals were brought to trial. And... The Nuremberg Trials, a series of trials, were held to prosecute members of the political, military, and economic leadership of Nazi Germany for crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and conspiracy. They were held in the Nuremberg Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, Germany from October 18, 1945 to October 1, 1946. The first and best known of these tri trials was the International Military Tribunal. Twenty-two of the most prominent captured Nazi leaders were tried before judges representing the four Allied powers, Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States. Twelve of those convicted were sentenced to death, three were sentenced to life imprisonment, and four to prison terms ranging from 10 to 20 years. The tribunal also acquitted three of the dependents. Now, what you can see in this first photo is the victim of a Nazi medical experiment. He's being immersed in icy water at Dachau, the concentration camp, and this is to further the research of Dr. Sigmund Rascher. Dr. Rascher wanted to understand how long it would take the human body to die in cold, icy waters of the North Sea when Nazi pilots are shot down. This would aid in developing an understanding for the logistics of rescue efforts. The doctor submerged um, medical experimentees in the water, and many of them subsequently died afterwards. He would develop an understanding of how long it would take to bring the human body back to an ideal warm temperature from being submerged in cold icy water. In the second photo, you see a Roma or gypsy, victim of Nazi uh, medical experiments, taking seawater injected directly into the bloodstream. The idea behind these experiments, Dr. Rasher wanted to develop an understanding of whether they could make seawater potable. Again, with the intention of developing an understanding of how they could extend survival of people lost at sea. In the third photo, you see a variety of scars from the disfigured leg, a survivor of Ravensbrück, a Polish political prisoner, Helen Heiger, who was subjected to this medical experimentation back in 1942. This photograph was actually entered as evidence for the prosecution at the military trial in Nuremberg. The scars resulted from incisions made by military personnel that were purposely infected with bacteria, dirt, and slivers of glass. When the tri military tribunal opened and criminal proceedings began against physicians and administrators for their participation in war crimes, the charges were that German physicians conducted these medical experiments on these thousands of concentration camp prisoners without their consent. Most of the subjects of these experiments died or were permanently crippled as a result. As a direct result of the trial, the Nuremberg Code was established in 1948, stating that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential, making it clear that subjects should give their consent and the benefits of the research must outweigh the risks. Although it did not carry the force of law, the Nuremberg Code essentially became the first international document which advocated the voluntary participation and informed consent. The abuses of human subjects for the conduct of medical research is not isolated to Nazi Germany in the 20th century. For example, here in the United States, a very famous incident took place beginning in 1932 in Tuskegee, Alabama, and didn't end until the early 1970s. 600 low-income African-American males, 400 of whom were infected with syphilis, were monitored for this 40-year period. Free medical examinations were given, but the subjects were not told about the disease. And even at a time when a proven cure penicillin became available in the 1950s, the study continued. The participants themselves were denied treatment, and in some cases when subjects were diagnosed as having syphilis from other physicians, researchers intervened actually to prevent treatment of the research subjects. Now many of the research subjects died of syphilis during the studies, 
And the study stopped in 1973 by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare only after its existence became publicized and it became a political embarrassment to the Nixon administration. And in fact, not until 1997, under pressure, did President Clinton apologize to the study subjects and their family. Due to the pub- pub- publicity from the, na- uh, from the Tuskegee syphilis study, the National Research Act of 1974 was passed, which had its goal the creation of the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and, Bi- and Behavioral Research. They were charged to identify the basic ethical principles that should underlie the conduct of biomedical and behavioral research involving human subjects, and also to develop guidelines which should be followed to assure that much research is conducted in accordance with these principles. The commission drafted what was called the Belmont Report, a foundational document in the ethics of human subjects research in the United States. Uh, Carrying out its charge, the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research prepared the Belmont Report in 1979. The Belmont Report attempts to summarize the basic ethical principles identified by the commission in the course of its deliberations. The report is a statement of basic ethical principles and guidelines that should assist in resolving ethical problems that surround the conduct of research with human subjects. The Belmont Report establishes three basic ethical principles, respect for persons, benefits, and justice, and these are the cornerstone for regulations involving human subjects. The principle of respect for persons is founded on the idea that individuals need to be treated as autonomous agents, and those persons with diminished autonomy, the sick, the young, the mentally incapacitated, prisoners, etc., are entitled to protections. Additionally, the idea of respect for persons involves informed consent, and that is subjects to the degree that they are capable must be given the opportunity to choose what shall or shall not happen to them over the course of a research process. The consent process must include three elements, information, comprehension, and voluntariness. So adequate information must be provided to each potential participant. They must understand the implications of participation, and they need to volunteer to participate. The second principle, benefits, is that human subjects should not be harmed, and research should maximize possible benefits and minimize possible harms. The nature and scope of risk and benefits must be assessed in a systematic manner. The third principle, justice, is that the benefits and risks of the research must be distributed fairly. For the selection of subjects, there must be fair procedures and outcomes in the selection of research subjects. Under the current regulatory framework, starting in 1981, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Food and Drug Administration issued regulations based on the Belmont Report. As federal agencies began to enact federal code enforcing the protection of human subjects, more and more federal agencies that disperse funding for research had to guarantee that the funding was allocated for research based on these ethical principles of respect for person, benefits, and justice. So the main elements of what's now called the common rule, and the common rule is this collection of administrative rules specified by all the agencies that disperse funds, has a number of critical components. They have requirements for assuring compliance by research institutions. They have requirements for researchers obtaining and documenting informed consent. There are requirements for institutional review board membership at institutions, for example, public universities, how they function, how they operate, how they review research, and how they maintain record keeping. Finally, there's additional protection specified across these common rules for the protection of certain vulnerable research subjects, i.e. pregnant women, prisoners, children, mentally incapacitated, and so on. Now that we have an understanding of ethics in the research process, let's move forward to developing a better understanding of how research is actually produced. We're going to move towards theory building and then thinking about how to operationalize and measure our observations.